everyone! Welcome to Brain Cherries, a podcast for curious minds where we discuss topics around innovation, technology and entrepreneurship. This time we shift our attention to the latest scientific discoveries and discuss topics such as yogurt, probiotics, gut health and data science in the healthcare sector. Before we move into the interview, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Brain Cherries Podcast. Enjoy the show! Today with my co-host Erika, and we are interviewing a very special guest, Martina Poletti. She's a PhD student at the University of East Anglia, and Martina has gained knowledge in the field of health, nutrition, and microbiology thanks to various experiences in prestigious labs. So I'm excited that today uh, we'll get the chance to hear more about what Martina is doing during her PhD. Let's start with uh, with just an introduction of who you are and what you're doing. Mainly, what's your role and what are you researching? Uh, I'm a second year PhD student uh, in the UK and uh, I, I study uh, a very interesting topic. So I look at bifidobacteria and I look at how they uh, can contribute to improving uh, gut health. Yeah, so that, that's what I do and I'm very lucky because I'm in a group where we, we are uh, half of experimental scientists, so we work in the lab, and half of the group is uh, actually data scientists. So we can combine these two different skills to really look at uh, the mechanisms of, of this uh, bacteria and how they can benefit our health. So it's very exciting. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what's a typical day in, uh, in the PhD student life? I've been in different countries, as you mentioned at the beginning, so of course it's, uh, it's very different depending on the country where you are in. But in the UK, PhD students are uh, considered as students, so we have to follow some courses. So sometimes in, in, during the morning we would have uh, some training courses on like skills, for example, learning how to program or some uh, soft skills, so presentation or skills or um, intellectual property as well. And then we also have, uh, I am, uh, I'm working in the lab, so I do uh, experimental work in the lab. So then I would go in the lab and then prepare my experiments. And then the other time that is remaining, it's researching online, so reading papers uh, and also looking at the data. So if I have cool results from the lab, then I also spend some time analyzing it. And then we also have a lot of meetings and uh, presentations, seminars to just keep uh, up with the research that we do in uh, in our institute. So it's very, very varied. Yeah, it's super exciting. Like maybe you you would imagine that someone that works in your field would spend the whole time in the lab just doing experiments and then having someone else who analyzes the results or, you know, you would think that it's just one job the whole time. But it's really nice to hear that your environment is so full of various things to do and so exciting in this sense. Yeah, actually, every every day is different. You really cannot get bored, and uh, you also have a lot of. Uh, it's a very fast-moving uh, field. So every day you read a paper with new results, and then you have to change your research based on what you what you read and how is the field evolving. So you really have to be uh, up to date with uh, all the latest uh, research and, and trying to incorporate all the new results in your uh, in your research as well. And I think something interesting that uh, Martina told me is that in her field you also have to come up with your direction. So you have a boss that maybe has the direction of the entire lab, but then, you know, each individual person is actually pretty responsible of the direction that they're taking with the research. So we always found this very fascinating as opposed to someone that is just an employee in a company where normally the boss is actually the one that decides what are the tasks to do and where the product is going. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's the interesting part of doing a PhD. You really have a lot of freedom. And actually, you can come up with your own hypothesis. And, and if you can convince your boss that your hypothesis is good enough, then definitely you, you can go for it and, and test it in the lab. Awesome. So how did you come to work in this field? Is it something that always interested you or how did it start? So I actually started with um, a bachelor in biotechnology. So I started working on uh, human diseases and, and I started to know, for example, how people discover new drugs and wh- how we can use uh, science to improve human health. And then later on, doing my degree in nutrition, I found out about the microbiome. I found out that basically in our gut, we have a lot of different bacteria. 
These bacteria can really contribute to different uh, mechanisms in, uh, in our body. You have bad bacteria and, and good bacteria, and the, really the equilibrium between the two is important and it can determine many different diseases. And this is also influenced by nutrition, so by our diet and other environmental factors. So then I became really intrigued by, okay, how can we change uh, this environment to actually improve uh, health? And uh, that's how uh, I then got interested in the topic of my PhD and also big data. How can we use big data to predict some of the mechanisms that we can then use to find better drugs? Was this something that you've always been interested in or did you come to this topic recently? I've not always been interested in, I've always been interested in the nutrition side of things, how nutrition can actually improve our health. But uh, then I found out that, for example, uh, fibers, uh, which are not very prominent in our diet, they can actually modulate the gut microbiota. And then I, I, I found out about uh, probiotic bacteria, how they can use these fibers to proliferate in the gut and then uh, have an effect on gut health. And why is it important to care about gut health? It's actually a very hot topic at the moment. So you, you have to think that in our body there are a lot of different uh, bacteria and the biggest community is in our gut. There is an equilibrium between different uh, type of uh, species that they all have a function, they can all have a different effect on our health. And the equilibrium of this community is very important and it can be mo uh, modulated by different factors, uh, mainly environmental factors, for example, diet or the use of antibiotics. Also, uh, mode of birth is also very important and uh, nutrition in early life. And all these factors can really uh, determine the composition of this, of this community. And researchers have found out that uh, the composition of this community is correlated with, uh, with health. So, for example, they found a correlation between a dysregulated uh, community that we call uh, dysbiosis and, for example, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes. Alzheimer and other uh, neurological diseases. So in studying the effect that different components of this community have on our body and how we can actually uh, change it, for example, using nutrition, also some drugs, it's very important. And uh, bifidobacteria are a very important member of this community because they, they are one of the beneficial ones. So we can either uh, study how we can uh, maximize the, the amount of bifidobacteria in early life or we can uh, use them as uh, probiotics so we can come up with some formulation with uh, specific key uh, bifidobacteria that we can give to people that suffer from, uh, for example, uh, intestinal uh, inflammatory disease. And uh, this could maybe improve some of the symptoms and avoid them taking so many of the other drugs. Uh, all of them have side effects. It's super interesting. And it, it seems to me like the way you talk about it makes us think that gut health is something that we should all care about. So it's not just something that you might study in the lab and then you will produce uh, some supplements that people with these diseases or just in general everyone might take. But in our daily routine, we can do things that help us have a better gut health. Yeah, absolutely, because it's, it's all about prevention. So it's actually very difficult if you already have an inflammation uh, process going on in your gut to actually reverse it. Drugs, in that sense, they have a better strength, but they also have a lot of side effects. And the problem with these patients is that basically the drugs that you have now in the, on the market, uh, most of them don't work. So these patients have to change uh, between three to eight or nine different drugs with all side effects before being able to find one that works. And probiotics only work when there is no inflammation, so doing periods in which the inflammation is a bit toned down. But if we can all find a way to actually prevent these uh, kind of diseases and try to not to arrive to that stage, then we can all really uh, decrease the amount of uh, people that suffer from these diseases. It's very interesting that we always think that gut health and the, the microbiota is so only about uh, nutrition or antibiotics, but there are actually many uh, common drugs, paracetamol or ibuprofen, that have been shown to actually change the composition of the microbiota. So we actually take these drugs without really thinking about the side effects and actually our microbiota is changing and, and that can, uh, in the long term, could give you many problems. So can you explain to us what the microbiota is and what is its impact on all of this? So basically it just means uh, the group of bacteria that lives in your gut is established when we are born. So already when we are born, we get all these bacteria transmitted from, uh, from our mother. 
and uh, from the environment that we are exposed in. So already a few days after birth, we already have an established microbiota. Then this changes over time uh, based on many factors, uh, in particular the diet when you are very young. The diet is very important, so if you are breastfed or if you are fed with an infant formula, that has been seen to really um, contribute to shaping a different community. And uh, the microbiome is very important because we, we saw that the variety of the type of uh, bacteria that you have in your gut and also the, really the type of bacteria that you have can influence uh, your health. And uh, this is because each member of this community can have an effect on your body, uh, regulating, for example, the barrier function. So uh, our uh, gut uh, has a barrier that protects uh, us from uh, pathogenic bacteria, so from infections. And actually, if the community is dysregulated, so if there is a higher proportion of, let's say, bad bacteria, then the barrier function can be uh, compromised and then uh, this uh, makes us more uh, vulnerable to infections, for example. It can also modulate the immune system, making us stronger, so making us better at fighting other infections that can come to place. They've been shown also to communicate directly to some uh, nerves called enteric nervous system. So it's, a, it's like a brain, but it's in our gut and uh, those uh, nerves can communicate directly to our brain. So the community can actually really shape the way uh, our brain works. And that's why this community has been also involved in a lot of different diseases such as Alzheimer's and, uh, and Parkinson's disease and so on. So maybe that's also why we say gut feeling, right? Like we, we, <laughs> we used to say having a gut feeling, but now we're understanding that in the guts, there's something that works kind of like the brain. So it might just as well be that the impulse actually was generated in the guts. Am I totally wrong, Martina? <laughs> it is actually true. So you, you also hear a lot of people, for example, if they are stressed, they have belly pain or because the two are connected. They're, they are connected in both senses. So the gut regulates the brain, but also the brain regulates what's happening in the gut. So they, they, there is a two-way connection there. So yeah, indeed, it's, it's actually true. And um, Martina, you mentioned yogurt before. So um, I was wondering, is it true that yogurt brings about so many benefits? And are there specific kinds of yogurt that are good and not all of them? How should we decide? Or is it maybe personal? No, so there are some types of yogurt that, uh, definitely that are better than others. So if you opt for yogurts that uh, say live cultures of bacteria, then it means those yogurts contain some of the probiotic bacteria that I was talking about. So these include bifidobacteria and lactobacillus that have been shown to really have positive effect on our health. For example, they've been shown to increase barrier function. They've been shown to modulate the immune system and to really prevent some of the infections caused by other bacteria in the gut. So it's really different, the kind of yogurt that you, that you eat. And then there are also other type of food, uh, other type of yogurts that have been added with those formulations after uh, the yogurt has been produced. So those can also help you to get some of the probiotics in your body and, and therefore have all the uh, beneficial effects. The only thing we have to be careful of is that uh, there have been studies showing that it's not that you just take your, your yogurt once uh, and then you're done. You really have to keep on consuming it because these bacteria uh, really have troubles colonizing the gut when the gut is already inhabited by other bacteria. So they have to create their own niche. They have to really find their own space. It's not just you just eat yogurt once and your problems will uh, be gone. It's, it's about your general diet, also the amount of fibers that you eat, because these bacteria, they need to be uh, fed with specific type of, uh, of nutrients. For example, if you eat um, a diet rich in fiber, those fibers are uh, broken down, they're used as food by this uh, bacteria, so that the more you eat, the more this bacteria will be able to stay in your gut and, and stay there in a permanent way. So it's not only about the probiotic that you take, but also about your nutrition. It needs to be a combination of the two. That's why actually now they are creating a formulations where they combine the two of them. So in one pill, they combine the food, we call them oligosaccharides, and the bacteria. The two combined uh, have a higher effect than just the two components separate. We call them prebiotic and probiotics. And you mentioned before that there are cases where things go wrong, for example, in the case of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Can you tell us a little bit more what happens in this case? 
Yeah, so the um, inflammatory bowel disease is a group of diseases that is characterized by uh, acute inflammation of the gut. These are very serious conditions and uh, they are all characterized by uh, dysbiotic microbiota. So they have seen that these patients have a disbalance in the population of bacteria that they have. And that's why then it came the, the potential of curing these diseases by using either specific probiotic formulations or another procedure that is called a fecal microbial transplant. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. No, it doesn't sound great. <laughs> it can sound a bit gross, but it's basically taking the fecal material from one person who is healthy and then giving it to another person who suffers from these diseases and trying to use that to restore their composition uh, of the microbiota. So taking a good composition of a microbiota, <laughs> it sounds quite gross, but uh, it's been shown to work. It's a transplant of bacteria, basically. Exactly. It's a transplant of bacteria from one person that is healthy to another person that is not healthy. By doing that, they've uh, shown that they can really reverse the course of the disease. And this is another indication that actually the disease is partially caused by the, co uh, the composition that was uh, dysbiotic. It's very interesting, but we need to be cautious because this disease is a very heterogeneous disease. Each person is different. There is not only the bacterial component, but also genetic component that actually we can predict. We can actually divide the population of uh, people with this disease in subgroups based on the genetic background that they have. And we can actually use that to predict which either probiotic supplement, but also which kind of drug will be more uh, efficient with them. Going back to uh, the beginning, to your research and uh, innovation in the field, what sort of methods or frameworks do you use to study gut health? In our lab, we use a lot of uh, the big data. So lately, the research field has really changed. So before, uh, a lot of the experiments were based on hypotheses, but these hypotheses were really, they were not based on any of the big data that we can generate from these models. But now, what we can do, is we can just generate a lot of different data that we can use to predict what might be relevant to study then in the lab. For example, we can generate a lot of data of how these patients respond to different drugs, or we can generate a lot of data on at the level of the intestinal tissue. So what is happening in terms of the proteins and the genes? How are they? How are the genes of a person who has the disease different from a person who doesn't have the disease? And then we can use that to actually see what are the relevant mechanisms that we need to focus on. And then with that, we can actually go in the lab with a more targeted approach because we already know what's going on and we need to just focus on one specific mechanism, which we can then further test. So do you do your experiments on humans or animals? What, what do you use for, for your experiments? For uh, my experiments, I use a platform or a model that is called uh, intestinal organoids. And uh, you have to imagine those as a mini version of a, of a gut in 3D. In the past, experiments were carried out on animals uh, or cancer cell lines. So cancer cells were taken from a patient and because these cells can really proliferate very fast, they were used to test different drugs, different bacteria. But actually, we know now that they don't really reflect what is happening in our body because they are cancer cells, they're not healthy cells. But with gut organoids, we can establish those mini versions of the gut just by using a tiny portion, uh, a tiny uh, fraction of uh, the gut. For example, doing an operation or doing a, a simple endoscopy. You can get a biopsy, so you can get a small uh, fragment of the epithelial tissue. And you can use them to actually recreate uh, a small version of the entire gut in a, in a really miniaturized form. And that can be used to test many different compounds, so a drug, screening or also to screen different type of uh, probiotic uh, formulations and then you can check the effect on the gut and you know that that effect is similar to what is happening in a human. From my side, being a data scientist, I was particularly interested in understanding which kind of data analysis you use besides for uh, the ones that you talked about so far. Do you focus more on descriptive statistics or uh, you also use predictive algorithms that are based on machine learning, so a little more advanced? 
So we, we actually do both. I'm, I'm not the expert here, uh, but uh, some of my colleagues, they, for example, use uh, machine learning to uh, stratify IBD patients. So stratify those patients suffering from inflammatory bowel disease in different subcategories. Uh, what, what I was talking about before, uh, each patient responds to drugs in a different way based on their genetic background. They can use these uh, large data sets with uh, the genetic background of each patient and they can use the response to specific drugs to stratify them and divide them in groups based on how they respond. And actually this is very important for uh, what we call um, precision medicine, which means that actually we don't have to cure every person in the same way, but each patient is different and their response to a drug will be different based on their genetic background and also on their microbiome. And, uh, and we need to use this information to decide which uh, drug is uh, the best for them. So that's one approach. Another approach that we use is, is uh, network biology. We have information online, available online. We have databases about different proteins that are either human proteins or bacterial proteins. And then we can use some algorithms to understand if there is the chance that these two proteins may interact together. You have to imagine a protein like a 3D object with different parts, and then we know that two parts, like a key and a lock, may match together, and in this way there is a higher chance that they can interact. So we can use this kind of information to understand, for example, in my case, how the bifidobacteria may interact with the human intestinal cells, and if we understand what is the component of the bacteria that can actually interact with the human cell, then we can understand what is the mechanisms there and what is going on, what is the effect on the human body. And uh, this is very important. And so we can create these networks where we connect all the different components together and then we can analyze in this network what are the important nodes and, and important uh, mechanisms. And having to deal with such uh, big data sets, do you need specific softwares? So definitely. Uh, the this data can be really hard to uh, store. Uh, and another problem that we have is actually how to combine different data sets because there are so many different data sets available online and they're all very useful, but unfortunately the methodologies that have been used by the different labs vary a bit. So we need to find a way not only to store them somewhere, but to actually integrate them, clean them, filter what is relevant and make sure that at the end the data is comparable with each other. It can be actually merged together to, to create a bigger data set that can give us very relevant information. So in our lab, we actually um, came up with such platform. We called it Sherlock. And it's actually a platform where you not only you can store different data sets, but you can also filter your data, clean your data, and also create pipelines that can help you to really, in the first stages of data analysis, to merge these data sets and then come up with a really unified one that you can use for further analysis. Yeah, it's really interesting that um, at the end you decided to build your own system. Because, I mean, right now, I guess one of the major platforms in the big data uh, world is a Databricks platform. And they are the inventors of the Spark language that is used specifically to analyze big data because um, with their language you can uh, carry out parallelized computation, so it's more time effective basically, and they they became famous because their platform is really easy to use. But then uh, talking to you, I, I started to realize that in some fields, it might still be better to invest time and energies to build your own because you might have so such specific issues like you were saying, labs using different methodologies. And then so even if you have an easy to use platform that was already created for you, it might not be applicable to your problem because you really have to tackle and understand the different methodologies that labs used. So you need a lot of field expertise, I think, to do that. So you, you couldn't have an, uh, a data scientist that is used to working with, I don't know, banks and retail uh, clients um, having a look at your own data set in the healthcare system. Um, I think it might be really challenging for such a person that isn't a technical expert, but doesn't have expertise in your field. And I think in this case, it's extremely important to have both. Yeah, and I, and I think it's actually what we're struggling at the moment is that we, we have a lot of uh, data scientists helping us, but some of them don't have any uh, biology background, so it can be very difficult for them to understand what is actually relevant. And then on the other side, we have people like me with a biology background 
who don't have a really good knowledge on uh, really the specifics of uh, handling data, handling big data and, and all of that. And uh, we really need to find a way to combine the two and we need to find a, a way to speak to each other to, to be able to work together. And, and it's something we have been working on already. So most of the groups in my field are uh, multidisciplinary. So you really have statisticians, really computer scientists, bioinformaticians, microbiologists, biologists, all working together, but we are still struggling to really work together because the language that we speak is so different and we need to combine the two. It really seems like the lab um, in which you work is quite different from other labs, right? Maybe due to this, as you said, data scientists and biologists and so many different figures working together. I guess this is a main differentiator for your lab, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, some of the other labs, for example, in chemistry or, or other fields, they just focus on a specific mechanism and, and they just apply, you know, a limited amount of techniques to study that receptor or that specific protein. But in our lab, my boss really likes to tackle things more from a big perspective. So he really likes to come up with the different technologies that can, in the end, really help uh, to find a drug or a potential uh, probiotic that we can use. Uh, to tackle real problems. Of course, it's more challenging, so we really have to work hard to really understand how we can work together. It's, it's much more difficult when you're combining different disciplines, but it's, it's much more exciting as well. And how would you say that is the data analytics in the healthcare sector different from other sectors or other laboratories that you're working with? I think what we need to pay attention in our field is that the quality of the experiments that you are setting up really reflects uh, the quality of the data that you get uh, out of it. So, for example, I hear a lot of uh, colleagues complaining about, you know, they have a big data set, but the, the quality of the data is not really good and then they cannot do much about it. In, in my sector, maybe more different than other sectors, you have the, the biological component. So already how we deal with things in the lab, how precise we are, you know, there is the human error as well. So you really have to be careful at those initial stages of how you set up the experiments and how you really generate this data. That will tell you the quality of the data that you're generating and the accuracy of the predictions that you're making afterwards. There, there's a saying in uh, data science that is garbage in, garbage out, and it, ref it reflects exactly what you were talking about. So the, if the data that you are putting into your algorithm is not well prepared, then you will receive an answer because that's what algorithms do. They almost always converge. So they almost always give you an outcome of some kind. But if the data that you were analyzing were not well prepared, then even if you get a result, it's probably not going to be a satisfying result. And it's, it's quite interesting because some, some of the people who maybe don't work in the field might think that what data scientists or data engineers do is just put data, a bunch of data into an algorithm, and then the algorithm just processes uh, the whole data and gives you an output. Uh, but it's not that. Um, the biggest part of our work, and uh, I'm, I was happy to hear that it's the same for you, uh, but for data scientists, the biggest part of our work is actually to prepare the data. And I think what Martina was... Um, was saying uh, in terms of healthcare having this problem even more so than banks or other institutions it's something that I experienced myself so in my work I've, I've worked as a data scientist uh, mainly with insurance companies banks retailers manufacturers and I think in these scenarios what helps is that you are dealing with something that you are more or less you know that, that you more or less know so you more or less know what terminology a retailer uses Whereas in the healthcare sector, if you are not a doctor or a biologist, or if you don't have knowledge of the field, it's a lot harder. So during my, my research thesis that was on the ALS disease, and we were trying to build a machine learning model that would predict how fast a patient with, with ALS were getting worse. And so I remember the first time I had looked at the data set, and these were data provided by um, hospitals throughout Italy and Europe. The first time that I saw the data, I looked at the labels of the different different columns and I was like, what are these things? 
I had <laughs> no idea. Like the terminology was completely out of my knowledge whatsoever. So uh, I think this is what you were talking about when you said that it's even more so a problem because the data understanding, it's something that usually a data scientist with a quite broad knowledge of things in general in life can understand. But when it comes to healthcare, um, it's really not that case. I mean, it's a lot harder to understand even just the data that you're dealing with. Yeah, exactly. We, we can, you know, the data scientists, they, they can come up with a lot of different graphs and a lot of different results. But then actually we need to understand what is relevant for the questions we're trying to answer. So really trying to focus. And the problem with this big data is that you can get a lot out of, out of this data, but then what is actually relevant? And, and for that, you really need to know somebody who is in the field and knows the disease, knows the mechanism, knows the bacteria to actually understand, okay, you know, this name that I read, I'm actually familiar with it. And this is important for my disease. I mean, it's a multidisciplinary field, so we cannot know everything, but that's why we need to work together, especially for the, the interpretation of the data, which in my opinion is the most difficult part. Yes, but it's so interesting. I mean, I think this is the future. I mean, for me personally, healthcare is is probably the reason why I was I, I got so passionate with data science and analyzing the data because I mean it's it's in general it's interesting to analyze all these data that we are producing nowadays in all sectors um, and it's really good that we have both hardware and software nowadays that it's powerful enough to support the analysis of huge amounts of data. In my opinion, what could really change our lives in a meaningful way in the future is if you can apply uh, these algorithms to big data in the healthcare sector, because then you can really uh, start talking about personalized medicine. It's something that you talked about before. So being able to divide your groups of patients in groups that have similar characteristics, but are different from other groups of patients. And sometimes doctors, even if they have really good knowledge of the field, they can't do this just because they have so many data. It's impossible for a human brain to process so many data and so many different information about a patient altogether. Whereas in this case, an algorithm can do it because algorithms are just mathematical formulas. So they can interact with so many variables at the same time. And then the second step after this, so making the algorithms work for us in, for example, dividing patients. And then, of course, the second part, though, is to understand once you have your homogeneous group of patients, what's, you know, all the data understanding analysis that you were talking about, where should you focus, which variables are actually valuable to take into account and which are not, because this is something that algorithms still cannot do. They don't have such a broad knowledge. Talking about innovation and, and the future, what do you think is the outlook for gut health? Where do you see the research going? So I'm actually very positive uh, about it because now we all have all these different tools that we can use. Definitely now uh, we have understood that nutrition is a very important uh, part of gut health, of how we can prevent these kind of diseases uh, from actually happening. And then also how we can use big data to actually uh, find better drugs. So in the past, the approach of doctors was just, okay, we try different drugs and we see what works. But now we can actually predict uh, how these patients will respond to, to these drugs just by using this big data. So I, 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 see, I see it very positively that we will um, reduce the, the time that these patients uh, spend trying all these different drugs and we will have many less of these kind of diseases because now we know what are the important factors. I kind of have a tricky question for you. It just came to mind, actually. So I was reading a few papers um, on exactly this, so the application of algorithms to the healthcare sector. And lately, there have been some experiments in which um, an artificial intelligence, so a set of algorithms, was used to come up with uh, specific drugs. And so the paper was saying that the artificial intelligence, by having a look at so many data from the past, so how the different molecules interact with each other, they were able to starting to understand which molecules would uh, interact better with each other. So which ones would be more promising for the vaccines or for uh, some kinds of drugs. So I was wondering, would you trust their indication on which molecules or which elements to use in a drug or you wouldn't? We definitely need to start from somewhere. So I definitely would trust it. 
But the way the healthcare system works is that these drugs are not tested directly on humans. So I would first test it on, uh, for example, organoid and see the response. And then I would then move to animal uh, studies and see the response there and then eventually try it on, on, on humans. These algorithms are very good at the beginning to select, uh, you know, among thousands and thousands of molecules, what could be potential candidates. But then we definitely need to go through, you know, looking at models, for example, such as organoids or, or animal models to actually see what is the effect on, on humans, because we need to also predict what are, what may be the side effects. Uh, but that, that, that definitely saves so much time in terms of actually coming up with possible candidates. No, these approaches are very, very useful. I think we are almost at the end of, of our conversation. Uh, I was curious a little bit more. Uh, so for ex- aspiring PhD students or researchers in your field, do you have any piece of advice that you would give them to be successful in this field? And maybe if you want to talk a little bit more about your challenges and uh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, some conclusion uh, thoughts from you. Uh, maybe two things. Uh, one thing, definitely, I would advise people try to learn the, the bioinformatics part as soon as possible because this is the future. Even people like me, biologists, uh, people who work in the lab, they need to be able to understand uh, how to deal with big data and how to interpret analysis coming from big data. So definitely try to learn as much as possible programming languages. And, uh, and the second thing, I would like to see more and more labs working towards open data, so really sharing data between different laboratories. I, I, I know that there is a lot of money uh, in, in the place, that a lot of money is needed to generate these kind of data sets, but it's important that we all share those data sets for the community to use so that we can uh, make so many more powerful predictions. When we can combine different data sets coming from different labs with different techniques, we can actually see the whole picture much better. And there is not enough uh, sharing at the moment. So this needs to be improved in the future, I think. Wow. Well, Martina, thank you so much for being here with us today. You really shared so many things that me uh, personally, I had no idea about. And I think our audience is going to be so excited uh, to listen to this um, episode. No, thank you for inviting me. It was really nice. Thank you so much. And we'll see everyone next week for another exciting episode of uh, Brain Cherries. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.